together in the company of the spirits whose names have been etched in stone on the circle of friends and those who live on in our hearts. It is the merging of their voices with ours that continues to give us hope over 30 years into this fight. In the early days of age when our loved ones were dying all around us, there was fear and despair. As a dear friend told me, the only cure for the despair was to act, to care for the dying, to speak up to a government who sought to erase what was going on. It is still our work to join together, to act in courage, to guarantee those who have died will never be forgotten, and to support the work of ending HIV AIDS forever. today is Voices of Hope, for HIV AIDS have directly or indirectly affected all of our lives. We continue to hope, still even in the midst of doom and gloom, and with the confusion and chaos. Today the Voices of Hope comes from the heart of a child, and even though we may be considered as adults on the outside, we will forever wear the title of being someone's child. I would like to share with you a poem entitled, 
the gift from a child. The gift from a child brings unconditional love, a pureness of laughter, the beacon of hope. The gift from a child is a glimpse of life that beats within a heart of innocence and understanding. The gift from a child, a priceless hug, a spoonful of smiles, a cup full of love. The gift from a child, more precious than silver or gold, their love is the treasure worthy to be holy. The gift from a child, with each breath we take, create those memories we continue to make. The gift from a child, out of the mouths of babes, voices of hope that paves the way. The gift from a child, we are here to acknowledge and embrace their voices, the voices of hope, the ones that are here today. Thank you, Paris and Seth. Uh, again, let's uh, thank the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus and the Youth Choir for being here. be where we are today without forging partnerships, collaborations, and alliances with individuals and organizations, which oftentimes seemed interesting to come together, but all came together for a common purpose and forged together a shared vision for a world without AIDS. Today is the 25th anniversary of the World AIDS Day National Observance in the National AIDS Memorial. We would not gather here free of charge to the public with the luncheon that follows, with all that you see here needing to be put up, were it not for dedicated partners and allies that helped make this possible. For 25 years, we've opened this space to our community because as the National AIDS Memorial, it's what is right. Today I would like to focus on Quest Diagnostics, who has been our lead presenting partner for the last several years. And again, this year, we are so humbled to have their support as we have for the last four. Each year, as Wells Fargo's done in the past and as Quest is now doing, uh, we take a moment and we get to hear from our partners as to the importance and what it means to join forces and to forge a path together. This year, as occurred in the first year, we're blessed to have with us Dr. Rick Pisano. Dr. Pisano is a world leader in infectious medicine. He is head of therapeutic and diagnostic services as well as the medical director for Quest Diagnostics, and I know I just butchered that, right? <laughs> I, know, I know you'll help me out. Rick holds deep in his heart the journey that we've all been on, because Rick started at Stanford University, and then practiced here in the Bay Area, has got deep roots here in the Bay Area as it relates to HIV and AIDS and treatment, and last night it was really a blessing to see for him uh, and for many who know him, uh, much of a reunion and a coming home. So, would you please help me in welcoming Dr. Rick Pisano of Quest Diagnostics. Uh, thank you, John, and, and I have to say that just standing up here looking at this audience is inspiring. So thank you all for joining. 
So on behalf of Quest Diagnostics, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you all for joining the World AIDS Day observance at the National AIDS Memorial Grove. And as John said, as a practicing physician in the Bay Area, um, I saw firsthand the impact of the AIDS epidemic on my patients as well as my friends. So I have very personal roots in, in this disease and epidemic. For this year's World AIDS Day observance, the United Nations has selected a theme, Know Your Status. As a laboratory, Quest Diagnostics helps people knowing their status so they can take actions to be healthy. And that's at the core of what we do, but it's not enough. In fact, the most recent uh, study available from the CDC estimates that of the 1.1 million people living with HIV today, one in seven do not know their status. So the theme, Know Your Status, calls out to all of us to make sure that our friends and our family have access to HIV testing so that they are empowered by knowing their status to take the best steps for their health. Testing is one of the crucial ways that we'll be able to both reduce new infections and make sure that people get the treatment they need to live full and healthy lives. But testing is a part, only a part, of the larger picture of how we collectively dedicate ourselves to improving the community's health. Today's observance in here in San Francisco also has an important theme, as was noted, a theme that connects us with the idea of a healthier community. That theme is Voices of Hope. It's exciting to hear about the work that many community members and organizations are doing. However, among the most exciting Voices of Hope are those of our young leaders. Like the recipients of the National AIDS Memorial Grove's Pedro Zamora Young Leaders Scholar Program, who are dedicated to ending the AIDS epidemic. Their voices and actions can help guide us to make progress together as a community to a more hopeful and healthier future. For many of us here, the, the, the National AIDS Memorial Grove holds a special place in our hearts. It is an organization that brings us together for remembrance, for healing, and for building community. At Quest, we are very proud and honored to be a part of that community today on World AIDS Day and throughout the year. Again, we extend our heartfelt thank you for the opportunity to join together today. Thank you. Chairs up front, uh, there may be some people in the back. If you have a chair that's next to you that is unoccupied, would you please raise your hand? And if there's anybody in the back that's looking for a seat, please come forward. They're going out because they got here at 11.30. And they're leaving. My name is John oh, Cunningham, so I can continue. Yes, and I'm yeah. a man living okay. with AIDS. I would like to invite others here today who are living with HIV or AIDS to stand and be recognized. a place of remembrance so that the lives of people who died of AIDS are not forgotten and that the story will be known by future generations. Today, we gather in such a place of remembrance, and today we will share stories of hope and in so doing, keep the memories 
of those we've lost alive. Five years ago, the National AIDS Memorial embarked on a very aggressive strategic plan. And within that plan, the organization stepped forward and owned the responsibility of ensuring that the stories of the AIDS epidemic will be curated, captured, preserved, and shared so that the stories of the epidemic will never be forgotten. As any organization, it's critical and important to know where your core competencies are and where they're not. And our organization is not, and was not, at that time, a storyteller or oral history organization. So we sought a partner to join forces with us who would be able to bring the skills to this important process. And as luck or as the universe would have it, we teamed up with the HIV Story Project. And over the last four years of what we originally referred to as joining forces, surviving voices, we have together produced some deeply important content which will live on long after all of us have left. These stories document the history of the epidemic, whether it was the first surviving voices and the unique story of the San Francisco leather community, which was truly the first San Francisco model. Or three years ago, with the hemophilia community and the tragedy that befell that population and those brothers as a result of neglect and denial from a government. Or last year, the story of women in the epidemic and the unique challenges that women had and continue to have to this day around the AIDS epidemic, which has been so heavily focused on men. Or this year, as you will hear in a few minutes, the API community, Asian and Pacific Islander community, and their unique challenges. And I can say that that's this project this year, with the number of diverse cultures that wrap this was indeed a challenge. All of these stories bring about lessons. And I know for myself personally, it is my responsibility and it is my desire to have as my legacy that those stories will live on and the lessons of the epidemic will never be forgotten and we will never return to a time of neglect, stigma, discrimination, and forget. I am so pleased to formally announce that after four years of partnering, we are legally joining forces and together with the HIV Story Project becoming part of the National AIDS Memorial family, we will continue to produce compelling stories for the future. Beyond new content, this merger will also bring the amazing content that this organization has produced over the last decade Generations HIV, and the more than 1,500 individual stories that exist there, or the full-length films that continue to be shown. The HIV Story Project was a vision and a dream of two incredibly creative individuals. If you would now please help me in welcoming to the stage the two co-founders of the HIV Story Project, our friends, and our partners, your Folkley and Mark Smokers. Hello, my name is Jörg Folkley. Hello, my name is Mark Smolowitz. I've been living with HIV since 1999. In early 2009, the two of us came together as filmmakers and as activists to produce an award-winning omnibus feature film about AIDS called Simply Still Around. It was comprised of 15 short films that helped put a diverse and present-day face to those surviving and thriving HIV at the time of the 30th AIDS epidemic. 
While making is still around, we met with many local HIV nonprofit organizations here in San Francisco and realized that almost all of them needed our help when it came to using media and activating their message. Out of that, an idea was born to form a standalone nonprofit organization with a singular focus on film and media production around HIV and AIDS in the present day. We called it the HIV Story Project. Fast forward to 2018, and the HIV Story Project has a total of three significant documentaries under its belt, including a widely seen feature film, Desert Migration, about long-term survivors, as well as some 70-plus public service announcements and unique web videos, and as John mentioned, Generations HIV, an interactive video storytelling booth that many of you participated in that now has recorded 1,500 testimonials about <laughs> Now this brings us to the reason why we're standing before you today. Perhaps the most powerful and important partnership that has emerged for us in recent years was, as John mentioned, joining forces surviving voices, our storytelling work with the National AIDS Memorial. As our work on surviving voices grew each year, a series of internal and important discussions, well, <laughs> important discussions has been unfolding in the background about our shared mission, vision, and values. And we are proudly here today on World AIDS Day 2018 to officially announce the merger of our two organizations. The National AIDS Memorial and the HIV Story Project are now, in fact, one organization. This is a nonprofit marriage made in heaven. As the Grove continues to develop plans for its brick and mortar center for social conscience, the HIV Story Project shall serve as the center's internal anchor for the creation of powerful new content and the leveraging of existing HIV stories from all around the world. Jorg and I won't be disappearing anytime soon, and we plan to stay active behind the scenes. To be sure, as long as AIDS is still with us, you can count on us to partner with all of you when it comes to capturing stories for future generations. So in closing, and as we move into this new chapter, we'd like to thank everyone who believed in the work of our small bootstrapped San Francisco uh, nonprofit. To every individual, company, and foundation who support our projects, thank you. To every nonprofit that partnered with us and believed in our work as filmmakers, thank you. To the over 1,500 people who stepped inside our storytelling booth to record their personal stories about HIV and AIDS, thank you. And to that very special group of people who have served on our board of directors throughout this journey, thank you. I cannot finish this without thanking this man next to me, Mark Smolowitz, who's been my partner in crime for the last almost 10 years, who has not only dedicated the past 10 years to the work we've been doing, but he has actually been an activist in the community for well, I'm not going to mention how long, but it's been a long time. <laughs> okay, girl. <laughs> Back in the day, we used to joke, we're just producing partners. <laughs> so, Thank you, York. Um, as a last thing, we would like to actually ask anyone who has a connection to us, to our past board, present board, anyone who has stepped into our storytelling booth, anyone who's been has partnered with us, to stand up and let us see um, how many people are here that have actually been touched or that we have to, uh, that have touched our stories? That's all we're here to say. Thank you so very, Thank you. very much. Thank you. My name is Seth Hammock, and I'm a reckless. Now you might ask what that is, and myself, I didn't know until I kind of learned of this community. Rec collectors are people whose parents died of AIDS. As I said before, my dad passed away 2004 of AIDS. And I had known my father had had AIDS since two, or 1987. And I had the privilege of knowing him and his story as I grew up. Not everyone in the rec collector community knew the full truth about their parents. 
And I'm proud to introduce this group and honor them with the, the um, Tom Wayne Unsung Hero Award this year. And this community was built of people who didn't necessarily know that there were others like them. And for me, this is very personal because my story with the Grove started out as volunteering. Um, and I volunteered for 10 years and then I slowly came onto the board because this community that the Grove has built means so much to me. I didn't know I had a whole other community, people who had a shared experience of growing up with a, a parent who had HIV. For some people, that was a stigma or something that wasn't spoken of. Luckily for my family, it was acknowledged. And so when my dad passed, I didn't have to say with shame that he died of HIV. But that wasn't the case for everyone. And so to have a community to share that experience with has become very important for people as they come into their own adulthood. And the Grove is proud to work with the recollectors over the last few years and to help them grow their community and to become a larger part of that connected community. Because what the Grove means for me is that I have a space where I can bring my daughters to meet their grandfather who they will never meet. And having that space and having that community to introduce them to, to introduce you to them today, they're, they're here. And it's very special to me to be able to have my daughters and share with them who their grandfather was, but also to be able to share my own experience with a wider community is something that is just really important and special to me. So it's my privilege to introduce two of the rec collectors, Whitney Joyner and Lisa Abbott. Thank you, John Cunningham, and thank you, National AIDS Memorial Grove, for this tremendous honor. Whitney Joyner and I were talking on the phone back in 2012 when we realized that we were each facing the 20th anniversary of our father's deaths. Whitney's father, Joe Joyner, died on September 22nd, 1992. My father, Steve Abbott, died on December 2nd, 1992 at the Zen Matri Hospice in San Francisco. I told Whitney that I'd read a Newsweek that stated that in 1992, AIDS was the leading cause of death for men age 18 to, 20, 18 to 45. Some of those men must have also been fathers, we said. I'd also recently read Sarah Schulman's brilliant book, Gentrification of the Mind, where she asks, where are the children of people who died of AIDS? There must be hundreds of thousands of them. Most children of murdered parents coalesce into some kind of community, but not these. I fear that the descendants of people who died of AIDS do not fully understand that their parents perished because of governmental and societal neglect, not because he or she was gay or used drugs. Where is our catharsis, our healing? Before we hung up the phone, Whitney and I knew we wanted to find those kids. So in 2015, we launched the Recollectors Project to remember parents who died of AIDS and to connect their adult children through storytelling, public talks, and private meetups. When we started, we had only the two of us. Now we have over 200 recollectors around the country and around the world. Many of those recollectors are here today, having flown in from Pittsburgh, Denver, Atlanta, Tacoma, Boston, DC, Cleveland, Alabama, North Carolina, and are meeting for the first time. If you lost one or more parents to AIDS, we'd like to ask you to please stand up. We've lost closeted dads whose deaths were shrouded in secrecy. We've lost leather daddies who marched in parades. We've lost mothers who struggled with addiction and poverty and mothers who supported Ronald Reagan. 
Some of our rec collectors have gone on to work in the healthcare industry or transform their, act, their loss into activism or art. Others still feel that they can't speak openly about the nature of their parents' death. Some recollectors live with HIV today. But for all this diversity, there's one sentence that we have heard over and over again when we find each other. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> to find out that you're not alone, to meet and speak with others who understand your unique loss is an incredibly transformative experience. I know it has been for me. When my father died in 1992 in rural Kentucky, I was 14, my mother suggested I tell people he died of cancer. I barely spoke about his death to anyone. And for most of my life, I had a variety of anxiety-fueled reactions when telling someone that my father died of AIDS. I'd laugh nervously, or I'd try to change the subject immediately after. It felt so huge so overwhelming that I literally could not hold the truth in my body. Underlying it all was a feeling of, will this person understand? Will they get it? And sometimes, will they still like me afterward? Okay. A mix of apologizing and justifying, although there was nothing to apologize for, and feeling fiercely protective of my, of my father and his story. It's only been in the past few years since starting this group with Alicia and meeting others like me that I can talk about my father openly. Meeting other recollectors and hearing their stories has been tremendously healing for both me and my family. And we've heard over and over again that other recollectors feel the same. Finally, there are people who do, in fact, get it. We know many of you here also get it. And we're incredibly honored to be among you today and to receive the Tom Way and Unsung Hero Award. Receiving this award validates our community, which has so often felt invisible in the history of AIDS. It affirms that our unique experiences are worthy of consideration and also helps us memorialize our parents in a whole new way. Today, we also want to announce that we have a fundraising campaign we're launching in order to dedicate a boulder in the Grove to parents who died of AIDS. The Recollectors Project primarily exists online, on Facebook and on Instagram, where we share our stories and connect with each other. But this engraving, located in a living and breathing place, the beautiful AIDS Memorial Grove, would be a permanent and public marker for the many adult children who lost parents, the adult children who for too long had felt alone in their grief many of whom still feel they can't go public. The cost of this dedication and engraving is $10,000. We're seeding the campaign with $1,500 of our own money, and last week we raised another $1,500. I hope that you can help us raise the remaining $7,000 by January 1st. We hope that this time next year, that boulder will be in place here and we can gather again. You can find our campaign on GoFundMe or you can donate directly on the AIDS Memorial website using the pull down menu, there's Recollectors Boulder. But for now, I wanna thank you again for holding us in your heart and for accepting us as one of you. Hello. Uh, my name is Judd Winnick, and uh, hi. Um, and about 200 years ago, I was on a TV show uh, on MTV, MTV's Real World San Francisco, uh, back in 1994. And uh, my uh, wife, Pam Ling, who was my wife at the time, uh, and I had the privilege of living with a young man named Pedro Zamora. And, uh, sure. For those who don't know, but y'all do. Um, Pedro is a 22-year-old AIDS educator and activist um, who agreed to go on the real world, and for the very first time, millions of people around the world actually saw what it was like to see someone who was living with AIDS. Living with AIDS. He could hold a job, he could live his life, he could fall in love, and for the very first time, they actually saw it. Millions of people. 
And I know it might sound like hyperbole, but I think we can all agree that he actually is someone who changed the world. He really did. <laughs> A year before The Real World, so 1993, uh, Pedro is actually asked to come on the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, this is 1993 Oprah Winfrey. So she's just merely the talk show host of the biggest talk show in the whole wide world, not like Oprah of today who makes Beyonce nervous. Um, <laughs> she's giant, but you know, still. Um, so Pedro's gonna go on the show. Um, they fly him out, they put him up. And the day of the filming, he comes to the studio, and they tell him, like, yeah, we've been talking about it, and uh, instead of being on the panel, we were, uh, we were thinking that it'd be better if you were in the audience, and uh, then you can ask a question. And Pedro's, what? Um, it's like, so you want me to pretend that I just came in off the street, and I should, because you have to get up and say who you are, and that you're living with AIDS, and then ask, ask a question. He goes, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. It's like, Sorry? It's like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I was, I was brought here to be on the panel. I'm not going to do that. Not, and basically saying, like, I'm not going to be a part of your little roots. Um, yeah, I can love that. <laughs> and they told him, like, well, you know, then this is what we decided to do. You won't be on the show. He goes, yeah, then I won't be on the show. Thank you. Um, so the producer then went and spoke to, as Pedro thinks, Oprah. And then she came back moments later and said, okay, instead, uh, what if you sit in the front row and then Oprah will come over and introduce you and then you can make a statement or ask a question. And Peter said, yeah, that'll be fine. Um, so then the panel spoke. And the panel turned out to be, how to put it politely, this conga line of <laughs> homophobic bigots. So, um, so by the time Pedro got to speak and Oprah came over and introduced him and Pedro stood up, he is just rip shit. And um, <laughs> just gets up and said, yes, um, I think what we're not addressing here is that uh, AIDS is not a moral issue. It's a health issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he went on to point out that what we need to do is to educate young people about how to protect themselves and empower each other. That's what AIDS is about. That is why we're here. That is what we should do. Yeah. And then he yeah. said. So a year later, uh, when we're doing the real world, he, uh, you know, do you want to see my appearance on Oprah? Yes, Pedro, I would like to, yes. Uh, so I watch this on videotape, and um, I see him there, and I go, wow, uh, you were pretty mad. He goes, oh, yeah, I was furious. I was furious. I said, well, you know, what were you thinking? Like, well, I was thinking, what I wanted to get up is I wanted to jump up and say, what a bunch of vicious assholes you guys are. <laughs> he said, but I knew I had like two minutes to talk to millions of people. And I know what I wanted to say, but I know what they needed to hear. And so when Pedro went on the real world and let people see his life and millions of people to understand who he was and what it was like to live with AIDS, he knew that that's what people needed to hear. So a few years ago, our very good friend Eric Chisulo, who's over there, um, came to us and let us know that uh, the Grove has a scholarship fund, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask that they rename it in Pedro's name. And we thought that was perfect, because that's what Pedro wanted. The Pedro Zamora Leader Scholarship is about young people who have empathy, who have passion, and who want to tell people what they need to know. And that is just what Pedro wanted what we need to know. So with that, I would like to introduce my very good friend who made this all possible. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eric Jusula. of the National AIDS Memorial, and I'm grateful and astonished to be standing here with you 27 years after being diagnosed with AIDS. Um, Pedro was um, extraordinary. 
and, um, and groundbreaking and changed the world. Um, and a lot of that was because of, he was, he was catapulted to notoriety through the real world. But he wouldn't have changed the world if he weren't prepared. If he hadn't done the work that he did for the three years prior, where he educated hundreds of junior high school and high school students in South Florida, where no one really wanted him to speak about what it meant to be at risk for HIV and how to protect yourself. Um, around the time that Pedro became known, and afterwards, there was a surge in science-based, peer-driven sexuality education that actually seemed to make a difference in the epidemic. But if Pedro were here today, I think it's fair to say that he would be appalled, absolutely appalled, not just at the daily chaos coming from the twit and sheep on Pennsylvania Avenue, <laughs> but by the barren landscape that we call sexuality education in America today. Wow. What we have instead is a glut of abstinence-based and heteronormative education, which drives new infections and unintended pregnancies, and truncates young lives, and disrupts communities. I think he'd be appalled that science-based interventions are bankrupt beggars at the, at the door, and that we still face the incredible injustice of unbelievably disproportionate infection rates among women and young people of color, particularly young African-American, same-gender loving men. That being said, I think, in keeping with today's theme of Voices with Hope, he would also be extraordinarily proud that in his name, we have established a fund to support the work of young people today who are leaning in, in an often hostile landscape and making a difference in their communities, bringing back meaningful science-based sexuality education, standing up to prevention and to injustice, standing up against the criminalization of HIV and making a difference in sound and sane HIV <coughs> policy. The Grove is proud, grateful to our sponsors, Gilead and Wells Fargo, for giving us the opportunity to invest in these young leaders, not because they're our hope for tomorrow, but because they're the emerging leaders today that are making a difference in today's epidemic. I never want to hear us talk about young leaders as the, as the hope of tomorrow. That's bullshit. I get to say that here. That's bullshit. It has always been young people who have led social movements for change. That was the truth in the 80s and the 90s of the epidemic. The truth in the 20th century it will always be the truth. And we are so fortunate to have three young people here today who are going to speak the truth to us. I can't wait to hear what they have to say, and I can't wait to see the work that they continue to do. And with that, I want to introduce my co-chair of our Young Leaders Scholarship Program and one of our newest board members, Annie Wilson. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Annie Wilson. I'm very fortunate to have been a 2012 recipient of this scholarship and new board member to the National Leagues Memorial Grove. As a co-chair and judge of the scholarship committee, I am constantly amazed by the stories and the tenacious spirit that our applicants share with us. This comprehensive, the comprehensive and intersectional ways that young people are approaching this fight today are inspiring, and I am so proud of the investment we make in our scholars. I want to thank Eric and Judd for giving an overview of our scholarship's namesake, Pedro Zamora, and a brief history of the program. And I think one of the things that strikes me the most this morning is that when Pedro passed in 1994, 
None of our recipients today, including myself, were even born yet. We all grew up in an era where HIV was a caution that we learned about, but none of us experienced the epidemic at its worst, or when stigma and misunderstanding about the disease were at an all-time high. In a post-Pedro world, it's up to our generation to carry the torch forward, and each of these recipients of the scholarship have chosen a unique path in the fight towards HIV and AIDS, with a variety of aspirations and career endeavors. As a Grove likes to say, to ensure that the lives of people who died from AIDS are not forgotten, and the story is known by future generations. As Eric mentioned, the scholarship has evolved quite a bit since its first year in 2009, and as we look to the future, we have a number of uh, ways that we'd like to grow the program. Next year is the 10th anniversary of the scholarship with almost 70 uh, awards given. And this program has created a community of young advocates connected by the Grove who can learn from each other and strengthen their advocacy through collaboration and mentorship. As we take the next steps in building and retaining this community of activists, I'm so excited at the potential this has for the Grove's investment in young people. And now it's time to recognize our 2018 recipients. But before I welcome our first scholar to the stage, joining me today to help introduce our award winners are Mario Diaz from Wells Fargo and Melissa Kinney from Gilead. With 33 years at Wells Fargo, Mario is a former board of director at the National AIDS Memorial Grove and currently in his second year as a judge of the Pedro de Morris Young Leader Scholarship Committee. <laughs> Melissa. Melissa is Vice President of US HIV Sales and Marketing at Gilead, and her team does outreach to support HIV treatment and prevention. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our first scholarship recipient, Coda Babcock. Described by his teachers as a deep thinker, a brilliant advocate, a brilliant writer, and a formidable advocate, and a student who has no trouble stepping up to the challenge without a fear of failure. Coda Babcock has the aspirations to become a journalist whose mission is to tell the stories of communities disproportionately affected by the HIV and AIDS pandemic. Through the discovery of the organization All the T, standing for Teach, Empower, and Advocate, in Denver, Colorado, Coda has thrown himself into a number of volunteer and leadership roles for multiple HIV and AIDS organizations and health clinics with a specific interest in youth engagement and pediatric care. To share more of his story, please join me in welcoming a scholar with the tenacious spirit, Coda Babcock. Clinic in Denver. They're the reason that I'm here and they have propelled me in my activism. Um, so Diva TV, an affinity group from ACT UP, taught me the media is the protector of history. It is the protector of our civil rights and it will save this community and fight for us to be believed when the government refuses, as it always has. Media is all around us, even if you think you're the one person who might not be affected by it, you are. It can either serve as a weapon on our side, fighting for us to be better accepted and humanized, or it can be the downfall if no one ever works to make sure that accuracy and diversity are a part of our stories and that in turn, their portrayal or reporting is ethical. In order to fight the stigma behind HIV and in turn find an end to HIV and AIDS, we must, we must first choose to help humanize people living with HIV and give this community the dignity that so much of the world still withholds from it. Because of this scholarship, I've been able to spend the past semester doing nothing but talking about media and its impact on people viewing it. And before that, the internship that I previously had with All the Tea was entirely focused on film and media and its effect on people's understanding of HIV. I'm going into journalism because writers listen to other writers. Being a journalist means that I will be able 
to make sure that other journalists are not push publishing articles that intend to make people living with HIV victims or perpetrators, because each and every person living with and affected by HIV has a unique story, and we need to hear story, not push fear. I'm also planning on being a storyteller for this community through documentary work, as well as by publishing fiction books, because if we do not represent our youth living with HIV, they will grow up thinking that they are alone. After dedicating hundreds of hours teaching workshops, lobbying politicians, and fighting for this community, I stand in front of you all today in order to say one thing. Without media, there is no voice. Without a voice, there is no hope for, your, for our future in this country and around the world. Use your voice, yell as loud as you can, and help as many people as you are able. It is a revolutionary act to care about one another when so much of the world does not value our efforts. I'm pleased to uh, recognize our next uh, young leader award, and he hails from Tucson, Arizona. His name is Nicolas Rios, and Nicolas, Nicolas started at the age of 15 his activism, and we can say that with a pride, activism. I think that that's the message we're hearing today. And uh, with the Southern uh, Arizona AIDS Foundation, he took notice of his voice, <laughs> He was able to educate others and his peers, and at the same time, he discovered more about himself. So um, it's programs like this that Wells Fargo stands behind because they're actually evolving every day, every year. And I applaud the board Grove and staff in allowing the organization to grow and merge with other organizations with similar stories. I was in awe of the Recollectors um, project I volunteered with Zeth, had no idea. I just thought he was with Hands On Bay Area, and it blew me away that there was a story behind why his involvement. So pleased to know you. So on to Nicolas. His uh, mentors have described him as confident, curious, aware, creative. And this is the best part treat everybody with respect. It's my privilege and pride to uh, welcome Nicholas Rios to the stage. Hello everyone, good afternoon. It's a profound honor to be here speaking in front of you all today for World AIDS Day. To be quite honest, if you had told me three years ago that I would be doing this, speaking in front of you all here in San Francisco at this amazing event to commemorate the lives lost to AIDS-related illness and to the advancements gained in the fight, I wouldn't have believed you. I had spent half my life unaware of the pandemic or the communities it historically affected. Growing up, that just wasn't something you talked about or learned in schools until you come out and suddenly all everyone can talk about is how your life is taking you down one path, AIDS. Now that's a hard fate to be dealt, especially alone. When I couldn't find guidance or support in my schools, culture, or home, I was left wandering aimlessly between harsh words and bigoted remarks and adults that didn't understand. I found my community in educators, activists, and other youth in my position. In estrangement, we found community. In ignorance, we found a passion to teach. In creating accessible safe spaces, inclusive programming, we ensure that upcoming generations know that their voice and experience matter in such a time of volatility. Your sacrifices have made it possible for me to be speaking here today. Now we work and fight for tomorrow's youth. I can say with great certainty that I look forward to a life of bridge building, community investment, and education education to bring about an end to the stigma behind HIV AIDS through continued work on a global level. I am thankful for the Pedro Zamora Young Leaders Scholarship Program support in my pursuit of higher education to better my service to my community through an international lens in my study of global health and development. I'd like to thank the National AIDS Memorial Grove 
for their commitment and investment in honoring those who have lost their lives in the fight and for their support of future generations of workers, advocates, leaders. Thank you. too, I'm really just overwhelmed um, by the recollectors, by the young leaders who are with us. Um, I had the opportunity to spend some time talking with the next recipient, and, and she's truly impressive. And I think that the ability of, of her and others to really change the world is, is really within our grasp. This grove really is sacred ground, a sanctuary, and I'm honored to join all of you here on this World AIDS Day. Solidarity and sanctuary, to borrow the words of Nana Khanna of Positive Women's Network, are even more important to our community today. Over a 30-year history, Gilead Sciences has been dedicated to serving and honoring people living with HIV and those at risk, including those who often go unseen by healthcare systems in the United States and around the world. That's why we're among those who pioneered the distribution of affordable medicines in the developing world, why we launched the 10-year Compass Initiative to address disparities in HIV AIDS in the, United, in the Southern United States, and why we are vocal allies of the trans community using our resources to raise awareness of the outsized impact of, P of HIV on people of trans experience. <laughs> and helping them access the treatments they need. Whether you've been in the field um, since the virus first emerged or you're new to the work, it's because of you and people like our next Pedro Zamora scholarship recipient that one day, perhaps sooner than the world expects, we will finally put an end to HIV AIDS. And with that, I'd like to introduce Emily Nold. Emily is currently a freshman at University of British Columbia. She was a driving force for a sex positive education curriculum at her high school in Gig Harbor, Washington, where she was co-president of APEX, the AIDS Peer Education Exchange. Emily believes that peer-driven sexual education is the most effective way to teach teens how to properly use contraceptives and understand the consequences of higher risk sexual activity and drug use with a goal to dispel stereotypes about sex and HIV AIDS among classmates, Emily presented safe sex demonstrations and information about the history, science, and prevention of HIV AIDS. With aspirations to study business and work for a nonprofit, Emily hopes to pave her own way and help those affected by HIV AIDS in her, in her community. Please help me in welcoming Emily Nold. AIDS Memorial Grove for giving me this incredible opportunity. There are not enough words of gratitude to express how honored I am to be here and how inspiring last night was. I also want to take the time to thank Maggie Anderson, the club coordinator of Apex in Gig Harbor, Washington. She puts her heart into the program and is the reason I stand on the stage today. Just graduating from high school, I come from a world where health textbooks are outdated. Curriculum is tailored exclusively to a heterosexual audience, and abstinence is always the right choice. I also come from a world where consent is brushed over, and students do not feel supported by their school administrations in cases of sexual assault, myself included. This is why I firmly believe that peer-driven sexual education is the most effective way to create an inclusive environment where students can discuss sex without heteronormative pressures, where students can learn how to protect against HIV AIDS, and where students are given the necessary tools to make informed, consensual decisions about sex. <laughs> the Pedro Zamora Young Leaders Scholarship has given me the opportunity to continue my studies at the University of British Columbia, where I plan to major in marketing and entrepreneurship with a concentration in sustainability. I am interested in social enterprise and how I can solve world epidemics such as HIV AIDS by creating shared value for a consumer. In today's market, I believe companies have an obligation to adopt a triple bottom line, 
where the values of a business are measured fiscally, environmentally, and socially. Look to Product Red, a nonprofit organization in New York that teams up with household brands such as Apple to raise money for the Global Fund to fight AIDS in Africa. Working for Red is a dream of mine, and the National AIDS Memorial Group has shown me that I can make it a reality. I believe a lot can be done to fight HIV AIDS, and the corporate world is a key partner. As an avid supporter of the cause and a thankful student, I am blessed to share this space with you on World AIDS Day. Thank you for having me. They tell stories of loss and hope, represented in the Grove by engraved names. The Grove is also committed to curating the stories of previously underreported afflicted communities that impacted the public landscape, creating grassroots organizations for support and activism, challenging neglect and injustices and voicing hope for the invisible. This is the focus of the Surviving Voices series. Without a fiscal partner, this annual film project would be out of our reach. Chevron, in line with their own global health initiatives, has stepped up to be that partner for the past three years. Here to accept our deep, deep gratitude, and to speak from the other side of this win-win is Chevron Corporation General Manager for Global Health and Medicine, Dr. Huma Abbasi. Dr. Abbasi oversees the creation and functioning of health and medical programs and services for the company's 40,000 employees. She also has worked in many countries on prevention and treatment of infectious diseases, including HIV AIDS. Dr. Abbasi. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here on behalf of Chevron and our continued partnership. What an honor and pleasure to be surrounded by people who are the force to end AIDS. And yes, we will end it here. At Chevron, we know the importance of using our global outreach programs to effect change. For more than 30 years, we have been in this fight to end AIDS supporting testing, education, treatment, and policy initiatives in communities most affected worldwide. Those initiatives started a few miles just east of this downtown San Francisco. Our partnership goals with the National AIDS Memorial center around reducing stigma, prejudice, and discrimination. Diversity and inclusion is a core Chevron Way value and permeates through our partnerships and projects. One example of this is our Surviving Voices Oral History Project, which Chevron is honored to be presenting partner with the National AIDS Memorial Group. Surviving Voices ensures that lessons learned are preserved in the future. It is an honor for us to be involved in this project that encapsulates medical, social justice, human rights, and community challenges. It is incumbent on all of us to take heed of those stories. Our project nicely dovetails into the theme of this year, World AIDS Day, Voices of Hope, honors those who helped capture and curate this diverse voices of the epidemic by telling personal stories of survivors to inspire future generations. These messages are the epitome of profound courage, unrelenting hope, and unity of humankind. This year, Surviving Voices spotlights the challenges of the Asian and Pacific Islander communities. 
faced with self-segregation and the unique approach to supporting each other. These stories that we are so proud to be supporting are powerful reminders of the past and the present struggles of so many communities. They will live on and inform future generations of the actions and the courage by so many to bring about a profound change that is very well needed locally and globally. The lesson learned from these stories and many solutions that came out of the AIDS crisis and will continue to support improvements to disease response and healthcare delivery models for years to come. In fact, those lessons learned run parallel to our workforce health strategies at Chevron, aimed at supporting improvements to healthcare systems, individual and community health and well-being in areas where we operate around the world. We are all gathered here today at a unique monument. This is one that has been created by the community, for the community, and maintained by the community. As a company that is very proud of its root in California, committed to fighting and ending AIDS, HIV AIDS here, as much as we were starting going back to 1986, we want to thank you all for your partnership and for inviting us to be here, part of this beautiful day and the event. Thank you. So back. <laughs> I had a costume change, I thought you might not recognize me. We have Hawaii in the house. You will meet, you will meet her in a little bit. My name is Jörg Fokali. I am the director and the co-producer of the Surviving Voices uh, uh, project that goes in its fourth year this year. First I want to thank Colin Holden, who's been my co-producer for three years now, I think. <laughs> And Vince Chrysostomo, who I was going to say you will meet, but I think 80% of you probably know him already. Um, he will be here after the video to say a few words. He was our community liaison this year and also a co-producer. Let me briefly tell you how the short documentary that you're about to see came about. As we have in past years, we always reach out to a number of organizations around the country that focus on the community that we want to tell the story of. This year, as you heard, it's the Asian Pacific Islander community. So we partnered with a bunch of organizations from around the US to identify 15 to 20 individuals that represent the long-term survivors from that community as well as the long-time activists. We walked away with actually 16 people that have worked and lived all around the country. And the 15 interviews that we created will be up on the uh, web, on the, uh, on the, uh, website of the Grove under Surviving Voices probably by Wednesday. We all need a few days to recover from this weekend. So by Wednesday, hopefully, the content will be up. What you are about to see is a 10-minute mini-documentary that is called from most, not all, of the interviews that we recorded this year, and that summarizes the experiences of the, the API community, both how it was affected by HIV, but also how the community impacted the course of the pandemic. I know that a bunch of people that we interviewed for this that lend their voices and their faces to this are in the audience. I would love for you to stand up real quick so we can uh, acknowledge you. So thank you, without further ado, here is the 2018 Surviving Voices mini-documentary about the Asian Pacific Islander community. Please direct your attention to the video screens. Thank you. The story and experience of HIV and Asian Pacific Islanders is really about invisibility. There would never be any data reported about Asian Americans. All the data would be reported as white, black, and other. But we knew what the impact was because we were seeing our friends and family members get sick and die.
The term that's often used to categorize a community is API, Asian Pacific Islander. Most recently, we talk about Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. One of the challenges is that the API community is not one monolithic block, it's huge. Countries like China and Japan and Korea, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. It's a, a broad and long list. By bringing the 21 million Asian American Native Point Pacific Islanders who live in the U.S. under this one umbrella, it gives us a critical mass to, to show our importance to our country's decision makers. And I remember there was a document that said there was at least 265 ethnicities and multiple languages and dialects. I'm like, God, I hope they stop counting after that because this is going to be really impossible for us to do anything. One thing perhaps that separates APIs from other ethnic groups that makes the response to HIV AIDS a puzzle, I think, is this model minority myth. You know, I grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We were the second Koreans in the history of the state. We were hardwired to be perfect. We're supposed to excel in school, be financially stable. Every good Indian boy is either a doctor or an engineer. We're only conditioned to show certain sides of ourselves. And sexuality, drug use, despair, low self-esteem are not within that. Shame and saving face are, are a part of so many Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander cultures. I know in my own personal coming out journey, one of the things that I was really worried about was losing the support and the connection to my family. My mother, you know, she first she screamed, then she cried, then she threw up and said, well, maybe I'll get cancer. I'm like, cancer, what are you talking about? She goes, that'll be my punishment for having a gay son. The connection that we have to our family members is so vital. And so when we are cast out, that has a profound impact. Um, and that drives so much of why there are such deep risks in our communities that we need to address. What is it that, that makes people engage in safe or unsafe sex? How do we talk about sex if nobody's ever talked to us in just plain, uncharged language? The stigma creates denial that I would even be at risk. If you didn't get tested, it wasn't a problem. If you didn't know, it wasn't a problem. One of the most difficult pieces that I experienced in St. Louis was not feeling that my skin, my face, my body, I didn't feel attractive to the community around me. When you don't feel that, that you deserve to be loved, you may take actions or get into relationships that you wouldn't otherwise. So I wasn't as careful around condom use. I tested positive for HIV in 1989. At the time that I was told, I had probably had six months to live. It hits me. It hit me in a way that trans being transgender didn't. I retracted and just hid myself away from people. And I remember picking up the phone and call my mom and apologize. She asked me if I would please not die before her. It's, God, what a horrible thing to ask of your child. How many people would like apologize for like dying earlier than the parents, except for Asians? I deposited for many years. And when I first came out to my family, their first knee-jerk reaction was about saving face, was about what would other people think about our family. On the opposite end, I had my family supporting me, my parents um, uh, telling me they accepted and loved me. And then there was um, Alan Jane Nakatani, these parents, they lost two sons to AIDS and one to violence. Both our sons, Glenn and Guy, were gay. And I have to preface it by saying that I was the most homophobic person having grown up with a background of gay is bad, gay is a choice, I felt that. Guy was about 20 years old when he was diagnosed HIV plus. At some point shortly thereafter, full blown HIV AIDS. And on his own, without even saying anything to us, he decided that he would start doing public speaking. 
guy talked about how he became infected with HIV and um, how to prevent. He filled school auditoriums like that because nobody else was talking. Nobody else was doing that. At some point in, in the end, he said, Dad, you gotta do something. And that's how One of Thy Children began in 1999. We didn't even have the book, we had no videos. It was just basically standing up and sharing our story. But I didn't really change over until I started asking questions to people that we spoke to. I found out that so many were hurting and uh, were hurting all their lives because they thought they were different. And I changed slowly, but turned over. For many of us, Al and Jane became our surrogate parents. And they kind of also helped us come together. In the 1980s, probably around 1985, 1986, there were almost simultaneously organizations that began in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and in New York. Some of these were informal support groups. And I remember seeing an ad for an organization called Amalgam, the Association for Massachusetts Lesbians and Gay Men. And I thought, I need to go there. Coming together in a room of 100 other uh, queer Asians um, and Pacific Islanders was a, a radical moment in my life. There really have been these parallel movements in our communities of responding to HIV and AIDS, but also building a sense of identity as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, as queer people, and then ultimately assuming roles of leadership. I think women were all really part of the fight and the rubric around API and HIV, and there was a lot of contribution. I was one of them. I quickly got connected to a lot of activists from across the country. And we actually needed to work together. We all knew each other. They didn't always get along. They'll probably tell you, oh, yes, we did. And we're like, no, no, you didn't. Eventually, over time, there were probably close to 70 organizations that were doing some kind of HIV and AIDS work. And we built connections that I, I think otherwise wouldn't have happened. My world has been changed as a result of that. And I hope that the values that have guided the HIV AIDS response are things that we can continue to use to teach the API community what justice is about. My mother disowned me when I came out to her for being gay. Back in February, she asked me if I had a good life, and I said, um, yeah, Mom, I have. And she, I said, have you had a good life? She goes, well, you know, God gave you AIDS, but he didn't take you away from me. And so she said, because of that, I've had a good life. So I thought, wow, you know, so all the, all the stuff from A to Z, was worth it. very much and thank you to Chevron for supporting this project. We were talking right before and I told them that um, 
My partner, Jesse Solomon, who died in 1991, and his volunteer was a Chevron employee. And after he died, every year he supported our work, so thank you for this. Um, with that said, I never know what's going to come out of my mouth, so I'm actually saying it. Um, but I have to say thank you for everyone that I called to be in this film. Um, in 1989, when I was told that I probably wouldn't live to see 30, I never envisioned that I would be standing here in front of a group of people. And what has really given my life meaning is the work that I found in this Asian and Pacific Islander community. Every person who's in this video reflects a part of me, a part of the journey. And, um, you know, I, Thursday night at Strut, uh, where I work now, uh, we had an Asian and Pacific Islander pre-World AIDS Day event. And I went to go um, stand in front to welcome everybody. And I saw several people who were actually in the film, but I realized, you know what? I made it. We made it. And I remember every, every year after that May 1989 until about 2002, I was told maybe I had six months or a year. And um, there were so many times that I just wanted to quit and just quit and give up. But I have to say, working on this project really made me glad that I survived. And I'll try not to go on too long, but like when I started doing the 50 plus program, it took me a while to realize that I was over 50 and I was aging. <laughs> um, but it took this project to make me realize I'm actually surviving. And I've had this incredible community who held me up, who mentored me. When I was living in Southeast Asia and I couldn't get the treatment that I needed and I had to come back to San Francisco, the API Wellness Center, my GAPA community HIV, my GAPA, my Gay Asian Pacific Alliance colleagues were here to welcome me and I'm still here. So thank you all. to York for inviting me to be part of this important day of recognition and hope. I call in the four directions and thank the indigenous peoples upon whose land we are on. I am Kanaka Maoli. I am mixed heritage. I am bisexual. I am 75 and stand on the shoulders of those who came before and those who left much too soon. What a blessing it is to be here in this place of hope and remembrance and to have the National AIDS Memorial Grove shine light on our Asian Pacific Islander communities and recognize the leadership of so many. I want to tell you a little bit of my story. I came out as bisexual in 1980. I, had, I was active in the lesbian community. That's not an easy place <laughs> or time to come out as bisexual. <laughs> and the AIDS, I lived in the Castro, and the AIDS epidemic hit. I remember the, the poster in the Star Pharmacy. It was Walgreens then. And there was a picture of a man's calf, and it said, if you see these spots, there was a gay cancer. That whole time, throughout the 80s, I'm an activist, lifelong community activist organizer. Um, it was all about gay men, and of course it was about gay men. But I want to say, I have to recognize, it was about bisexual men too. It was about bisexual men dying. <laughs> We had struggled to be recognized, to be included in the statistics. It took till 1984 to be included in the statistics. Even as we are scapegoated and told we did not exist, or we were spreading, we were the typhoid canaries. 
I'm here to say many of us have survived and are still on the front lines. And an identity never spreads HIV. Never. And I want to encourage you to say gay and bisexual men. So many of my activist partners, colleagues, lovers have died of HIV AIDS. So many of us, our parents have died. It's not just gay parents, it's gay and bisexual parents and transgender parents too, I am sure. And thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, being here. And um, all love and light hold us all. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Don't know if I have any uh, any tears left. Uh, the Humanitarian Leadership Award is bestowed upon an individual or individuals who through their selfless acts of love, compassion, and kindness have positively impacted the lives of others and in the process improved the greater society. The definition of humanitarianism is an active belief in the value of human life whereby humans practice benevolent treatment and provide assistance to others in order to better humanity for moral, altruistic, and logical reasons. It is the philosophical belief in movement toward the improvement of the human race in a variety of areas used to describe a wide number of activities related specifically to human welfare. A practitioner is known as a humanitarian. Earlier this year, during the filming of the API Surviving Voices Oral History Project, I had the opportunity to personally witness the filming of Al and Jane Nakatani. In that moment, I knew that these two individuals exemplified the spirit of this award, but also took it to a whole nother level. These two parents experienced the pain from the deepest part of one's soul, and that is the loss of a child. However, they did not lose one child. They lost their three sons, two to AIDS and one to gun violence. Guy and Glenn to AIDS and Greg to, the, to gun violence. How did they go on in the face of such pain and loss? This year's honorees knew they must honor their children's lives and share their stories with others to inform, educate, and carry the message of unconditional love to other parents around the world. Sitting here in the grove on that day, bearing witness to Al and Jane tell their story of personal growth with the underlying principle that all of us, all of us, are not only deserving of unconditional love, but, of human, but as human beings, there is nothing more important than to nurture the unique individual as they are and their two perceived differences as a gift. <clears throat> We are all raised with certain cultural norms or values instilled within us, which require us to constantly reevaluate and challenge those norms. Al and Jane knew their own journey brought them to a place where they needed to look at their own cultural norms and values, which were instilled deep inside of them not to just make change, but also to share with others their own growth. They have coined a phenomenon which, is, which they call, quote, kill, the killing power of human, of, of human self-degradation. 
It's a systemic and comprehensive process that degrades, disenfranchises, disempowers, dis diminishes, and destroys people on the basis of their own diverse human characteristics, otherwise known as otherism. I knew in that moment that this message, especially today, with the challenges that our culture faces, must be shared here. As we have seen, Al and Jane also became such an important part of the API community. And now I would like Vince to share his personal story of how these two amazing individuals impacted his life and that of the API community as a whole. Hello. So I first met Al, um, I think it was around 1997, and I heard this man telling his story. And I realized, oh my god, we don't have anybody like that doing this work. They're all LGBTQ folks who people kind of like, yeah, of course you guys feel that way, but we didn't have the parent. And one of the things that I think a lot of my colleagues will um, agree is that when you test positive as an individual, your whole family comes along for the ride. And um, so their stories help transform and bring together a movement. And I actually might take some heat for that comment I made about us not getting along as a movement, those of us that did this work. Um, but you know, we were family. We were fighting for our cause, we were fighting for something that we believed in. But one thing I can tell you is that we all agreed that if anybody deserved this award, it would be Alan Jane. And over the course of doing this, we just, there was a decision that we would put um, the two gay sons who died of AIDS, name in the grove, but a group of us got together and we talked about this and um, we said, it's not right. We can't just put the names of the two sons who died of AIDS in our culture. It has to be the whole family. It has to be ours. <laughs> It has to be Jane, and it has to be the three sons. And so last night I was with Jane when we discovered the names. There was not enough Kleenex in the Grove to, um, and then we were having our moment, and someone said, can you guys move along? Um, sex is the way of life, so I should move along, and I should invite Jane. Would you come up? from the time that we were all involved. These Californians supported us in the same-sex marriage campaign. And then John, who was a complete stranger, I didn't even know who John Cunningham was, or York, or Mark, or a lot of the supporters, and they've all become part of our family, Ohana. I just can't believe this community, but thank you. And thank you, York and Mark. That was a wonderful film. On behalf of Al, who's unable to join us. Oh, I have one more thing. I have a message for Eric. Where's Eric? With Pedro. Guy was a Pedro. <laughs> who is unable to join us due to his being ill. Our three deceased sons, Glenn, Greg, and Guy Nakatani, I want to thank the National AIDS 
Memorial Grove for recognizing our efforts to cultivate the acceptance and dignity of all who have died and are living with AIDS. Al and I lost our oldest son, Glenn, 28 years ago. 24 years ago, our youngest son, Guy, also died. Both Glenn and Guy were in their 20s when they lost their battle with HIV AIDS. And while their brother, Greg, was not a victim to AIDS, instead being killed from gun violence, Al, Al and I always include Greg when we share the stories of our sons with others. After Guy died, our lives and shambles, we had no idea what the future held for us. Six months after Guy died, I suffered a heart attack. And for a moment, Al thought he would lose, end up losing his entire family. But as you can see, I did recover. <laughs> Zumba. <laughs> and at some point, we set out to fulfill the promise we made to Guy, that we would continue to share our story with all who would listen with the hope that others would learn from our mistakes. In the beginning, with only our story in hand, a story later facilita facilitated by the book authored by Molly Fumia, she's not Japanese, she's Italian, <laughs> and a video produced by Francisco Leone and Judy Kamenichi, both entitled Honor Thy Children, we began a journey that has endured for the past 25 years. No matter where we went, no matter whom we addressed, our message has always been the same. With respect to HIV AIDS, if we want our young people to avoid being infected with HIV, we must begin by accepting, cherishing, and nurturing, and loving all children no matter the nature of their human diversity. <laughs> At the same time, we must educate our children that no matter how different we may be, one from another, we're each worthy of acceptance, respect, and dignity. We adults must both learn and teach our children and youth how to conduct ourselves within the context of health and wellness. While we have been educationally associated with the concept of the killing power of human and self-denigration, we remind people that in our case, the unintended consequences was that two of our sons got infected and died from HIV AIDS and one from gun violence. With respect to AIDS, we've seen the disease go from being a death sentence to one described as a manageable chronic disease. We've seen acyclovir, the one single ineffective antiviral <coughs> drug replaced by the myriad of antiviral cocktails that allows those who are living with HIV to live significantly longer lives. We've seen new approaches to preventing the transmission of HIV -V with PrEP and PEP, and the quest to develop a vaccine continues. But for Al and myself, we say much more needs to be done. HIV AIDS remains a stigmatizing disease. The rate of HIV infection remains unacceptable. Those living with HIV AIDS may be surviving, but for many, their quality of life is poor. We owe it to those who bore the brunt of the pandemic, those we remember and observe today to do all that we can to neutralize HIV's impact on our peoples. Again, thank you for your presence here today and to all those affiliated with the National AIDS Memorial Group Thank you for the honor you have bestowed upon our family. Before I close, I want to recognize someone who's in the audience. Her name is Anne. Could you stand up? <laughs> Anne was the best friend to 
to die. While he was dying, she came over every night after school, massaged him, delayed her school. She became an occupational, not occupational, I'm sorry, physical therapist. But she waited until Guy died, and she was with him at, on his deathbed, and just a wonderful, wonderful person. And today, she's a physical therapist with two young girls and doing very, very well in San Jose. In closing, we share the following with you. First, to all who have been made to feel vilified and marginalized, especially to our LGBTQI brothers and sisters, we say you belong. You always have and you always will. Secondly, to all of us, we share the words of the notable humanitarian Norman Cousins, who said, death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies within us while we live. And what Al and I take that to mean is never turn your back to who you are, accept and embrace the nature of your diversity while others may not. Never, ever destroy the essence of your being. What? Well, others may set out to do so. Always, always honor thyself and honor thy children. Thank you. Please stand up. All, all the Grove Board. <laughs> Truly an amazing group of people to work with. And our staff, where are our staff? I know you've seen John a lot. Where's Stevie? Where's Matt? Ray? Jeff? unenviable position of coming up and giving my closing remarks uh, and ending my term as a member of the Board of Directors of the Grove. Uh, it has been, here it comes. <laughs> that was my feeling. Um, <laughs> give it a moment, it, it will pass. Uh, oh my gosh, two feelings in two days, I do not know what this means for me. <laughs> This is so much harder than I thought. I said, you know, in front of my, last night I actually came with a speech that I was threatening to actually do today because I didn't get to say it last night because I was just so overwhelmed. But the growth is where I came back to life. Um, I, I was very, very sick at the beginning, at the turn of the century, and when I finally got back on my feet, the Grove is where I came. The Grove is the organization that picked me up and held me, and that trusted me when I didn't trust myself anymore, and believed me when I didn't believe in myself anymore, and actually thought that I had value when I wasn't so sure I had value anymore. I'm a 32-year survivor of AIDS, and uh, I'm also a drug addict in recovery, and uh, you know, at some point, one of those two things is gonna take me out. And to date, neither has, and to date, neither will. So, I wish you all, I, I really, actually, if you could just take a second and look around. Look around this room and see what you see. I see people that are still here 
in a very long but incredibly powerful, moving, touching age memorial. And the observance today that I think is one of the best observances we've seen. And realize that we are here, if you think about the theme today around the Voice of Hope, we are here because people had the audacity to believe that we belong. That people had the audacity to believe that we have the right to live. We're here. We're here because of so many people whose names are in the circle of friends, because of so many people that we saw on the videos, because of people like Janet and her husband, and of, we are here because of what's going to be coming in the future with our painters and more scholars. We are here because people said, I have value. I have value. I have intrinsic value as a gay man, as an injection drug user, as a person of color, as a trans individual, as a human being, I have value. My value is not determined by your perception of my right to live well. And I think, and I said this last night, and I really mean to challenge everybody out there. When you hear the word disparity, stop saying it. Our lives are not determined by disparity. Our lives are determined by justice. And disparity is a measure of injustice. When we talk about the disparity of new infections or the disparity in the uptake of PrEP use or the disparity in viral suppression, what we're talking about is injustice. We're not talking about some nice buzzword that we can grab around like empowerment or some of the other buzzwords of the early 90s. We're talking about injustice. And when we think about justice, we think about audacity. We think about hope. We think about merit. Everybody in this room has that. You have hope. You have merit. You have value. You have what I think we have to make a common agreement. You have the ability to help. To help one, help one, help one. I, wanted, I was going to read, uh, for my closing, I was going to read Vita Russo's speech uh, at the FDA in 1988, where he gave everyone those immortal words of someday the AIDS crisis will be over. And he said, remember that. I was going to read the whole speech because it actually, I think, is one of the most moving pieces of literature that's ever been written about the epidemic. But instead, I'm just going to leave you with two things. One, I'm going to leave you with this closing paragraph that people seldom ever read, and then I'm going to leave you with the Gay Men's Chorus. <laughs> Vito concluded his remarks at the FDA. It was an act of action at the FDA in 1988 where the people were protesting such incredible government inaction. Um, for people that lived through it, you remember this, how bad it was. Vito said at the very end of his speech, he said, you know, we're so busy putting out fires now that we don't have the time to talk to each other and strategize and plan for the next wave and the next day and the next month and the next week and the next year. We're going to have to find the time to do that. We have to commit ourselves to do that. And then, after we kick the shit out of this disease, we're going to have to be alive to kick the shit out of the system. So this will never happen again. So I actually am leaving the Grove uh, because it's time, because the Grove is in amazing hands, because we've got great leaders, we have great future leaders, we are solid, we are you. Um, and I'm also leaving because uh, I think it's time for the next generation to take over. And I'm happy to leave. Um, I'm actually really happy to get some of my life back. <laughs> I'm not going, I'm just stepping down. Uh, and it was, with profound, it was a profound privilege to be on the board. It's been a profound honor to be coming up here every year on stage to have some part of our World Day observance. Um, it's a profound privilege and honor and just sense of family that I have when I'm here with you. And so, I want to thank you for making my last nine years uh, so incredibly busy um, and uh, so incredibly rich. Uh, you are the reason why I'm alive. And I want to thank you for that. And I want to say thank you and goodbye to the Grove. So thank you. Yes.
Ernie were here somewhere, but I, I didn't see them. They were okay. somewhere in the back. Okay. I remember they and Jane. Yeah. Oh, there's Ernie. You remember Ernie? Hello. Hi, Ernie. How are you? Hi. Hi. 